Here at DCC, we give a priority to reading Scripture because God's Word is living and it is powerful and it changes lives. We want to read a parable that Jesus told again this week. From Matthew chapter 13, we're going to read verses 24 to 30 and then the explanation of the parable in verses 36 to 43. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Then Jesus left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are the angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of the Father. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. I want to read also from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 44, verses 6 through 8. This passage is also the basis for the message that I will share with you this morning. This is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. Who then is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and lay out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people and what is yet to come. Yes, let them foretell what will come. Do not tremble. Do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. This is the word of the Lord. Well, having heard the word of Scripture, I almost hesitate to tell you that the next word that I'm going to share with you comes from a comic strip. Some of you will recognize the name of Charles Schultz. All of you will recognize the name of the comic strip Peanuts. A comic strip that was put out by Charles Schultz. A a comic strip that featured his famous Peanuts characters had this tagline on it. Trust God. When we trust God, the future always holds Well, our text, which we have just read, begins with a quote from God himself. He says, I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. This short passage teaches us some foundational truths of which we need to be aware and on which we can build our lives. First of all, And most importantly, there is a God. 
Years ago, I was in a sales conference where the uh, famous, well-known speaker, Zig Ziglar, was uh, holding forth. And he said at one point, I'm not a theologian, but he said, there are some things I know about God. Number one, he said, there is a God. Number two, it's not me. Number three, it's not you either. <laughs> if someone tells you that there is no God, you can immediately know that you're dealing with a fool. The Bible says, Psalm 14 and verse 1, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Now, it's not always helpful to tell that person that he's a fool, but you can pray for him, you can share with him, and you can show by your life, your changed life, that you have a relationship with a God who is real, a God who is personal, that you know through his son Jesus. There is a God. Our God is the true God. In your Bible, the word Lord in this passage is spelled capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Wherever you see that in your Bible, you know that that is a, a transliteration, I suppose, a, a, a translation of God's name, Yahweh. Yahweh is a name that is holy, a name so holy that many people actually fear to speak it, and certainly we should not speak it in vain. Our God, Yahweh, is king. Scripture says he is king, ruler supreme. Israel's king is our king too, king of kings and lord of lords. And he is redeemer. Boy, do we need a redeemer. The concept of a redeemer actually comes from the ancient slave markets. A redeemer was one who purchased a slave, not to keep him in bondage, but in order to set him free. He paid the price and then gave him his freedom. And that is what our God has done for us. We were slaves to sin and fear. Our God paid the price to redeem us. The lifeblood of his own dear son. The Bible says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again with a yoke of slavery. To me, freedom is an ultimate value. We are blessed to live in a nation that provides a great deal of freedom to its citizens. In comparison with many of the nations of the world, we're in a very good place. As a motorcyclist, I love the feeling of freedom that comes when I'm on the ro open road on my motorcycle. That is a tremendous freedom. But I know that the ultimate freedom, the only freedom that is going to last forever, is the freedom that is found in a relationship with God that is real and personal. Our God is the one true God, and our God is the only God. Yahweh says, apart from me, there is no God. Think about it. Logically, there can only be one supreme being, right? There is only one true and living God, but there are many false gods. In Isaiah's time, many people were worshiping idols. Typically, these idols were carved from wood, or perhaps they were made from stone, or if the person was wealthy enough, they could even be formed from some precious metal. Most of us don't have those kinds of idols in our lives, but we have idols that take other forms. An idol can be wealth and the pursuit of wealth. It can be the desire for pleasure. It can be sex, fame and celebrity. Even happiness can become an idol. And things that are good in themselves, work, and even family can be an idol. What do I mean? An idol is anything 
or anyone that is most important in your life. Anything or anyone that is more important to you than God himself is an idol to you. Now, most of us are familiar with what are commonly called the Ten Commandments. Actually, the Bible doesn't refer to them as Ten Commandments. It actually speaks of them only as words. We know them as ten words. I like to think of them as tender words. They are not harsh. They are firm and loving guidelines to keep us from hurting ourselves and others. The very first of these ten words is this. I am Yahweh your God. You shall have no other gods before me or besides me. That's found in Exodus chapter 20, verses 2 and 3. The very name of God, Yahweh, means I am. I am. He is the great I am. And he says in this passage in Isaiah that we're looking at, I am the first and I am the last. That tells us that our God is eternal. Our God existed eternally before the beginning. And he will be there forever after history, as we know, has come to an end. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, we find God speaking, and he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Alpha and Omega were the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet in which the New Testament was written. And then just a little later in that same chapter, we find Jesus speaking, and he says, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. I want you to notice that Jesus takes the same words applied to Yahweh, God and applies them to himself. He is claiming divinity. It's who he is, the Son of God. In John's uh, Gospel, we find Jesus repeatedly using the phrase, I am, I am, claiming to be divine, identifying himself with eternal God. Our God is the God of your past, and he is the God of your future. No one else can forgive the sins that you have committed in your life. All of the wrong things that you have ever done, no matter what you have done or what you have been like, God will forgive you when you come to him in repentance and faith. And no one else can give meaning to your sorrows as well as to your joys, the way that God can. He not only deals with your past, he deals with your future. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. The one true and living God loves you more than you can understand or even imagine. To those who trust him, he says, do not tremble, do not be afraid. Troubles come from time to time. In this world, we are going to have hurts and difficulties. That's the nature of life on this planet. It's a broken world in which we live. But we look forward to the day when everything will be fully restored and made right. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome 
the world. In this passage that we're looking at in Isaiah, God says, you are my witnesses. You are my witnesses. What is a witness? A witness is one who tells what he or she has seen, heard, or experienced. After his resurrection, just before returning to his Father in heaven, Jesus repeated these words to his followers. He said, you are my witnesses. So I say to you today that God and his son Jesus Christ are speaking to you and giving you the same message that they gave to Isaiah so long ago. You are my witnesses. If you are experiencing the new life that Jesus promised, share it. Show it. Say it. Yahweh asks this question. Is there any God beside me? And I take it that the response there is Isaiah's response. And he says, no, there is no other rock. I know not one. The same question is for you and I today. Is there any God beside the one true God in your life? Is there a false God that may be taking priority that belongs to our Heavenly Father alone? Some of you uh, are aware of the fact that I tend to favor country music. But I sometimes like rock music too. As in, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. No, there's, there's all kinds of music that we can appreciate. But uh, I'm not even going to say what I've told you before about the music in heaven. If you don't know what I said, you can ask me later. A few days ago, I had a conversation with a man who had a major structural issue with his home. He told me how uh, the house... Uh, sank down um, at one point. Uh, the, the middle of it fell in, kind of, and things started falling apart. Cracks appeared. The problem was that the house had been built on concrete pilings, and the contractor who had built it in an attempt to save money by skimping on concrete had failed to put the pilings into the ground deep enough. They did not go below the frost line, and therefore they shifted, and the building was in danger of collapse. Now, when I talk about the frost line, I know that I should apologize to people in the southern states who don't know what I'm talking about. But those of you who live in cold country know what I mean when I talk about the frost line. And when you when you put in pilings or a foundation, you have to get down below that frost line. Otherwise, the movement in the ground, when it freezes and thaws, is going to cause a problem. A house must have a solid foundation if it is to stand for many years through all kinds of weather. Your life, just like your home, needs to have a solid foundation to weather the storms of life. Jesus said, Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Isn't it interesting that Isaiah, way back there in his prophecy, uses the term rock, capital R, to describe God. He provides a solid foundation for our lives. Jesus says, that the one who listens to him puts his words into practice is like a man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds came and beat upon that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Choose today, at whatever point you may be in your spiritual journey, to put your Trust on the God 
who is a solid rock. The only one who will never, ever let you down. And so I want to conclude with the words of Charles Schultz in Peanuts. Trust God. When we trust God, the future always holds hope. Father God, we know that you are the one true and living God. We choose today to trust you. And as we trust you, we know that the future always holds hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.